Okay, here we have the brochure for the 1967 Triumph Spitfire Mark III, a car which I've owned a couple of examples of. And here we see a young lady looking slightly fed up, while the gentleman of the group appear to be inspecting something under the bonnet, uh, presumably trying, for, trying to draw attention to the 1296cc engine that was now powering the Spitfire, but uh, less charitable, perhaps MG owners may suggest that they're actually trying to rectify a fault, but I'm sure that's not the case. Uh, I'm sure they're just in inspecting the magnificent four-cylinder engine that nestles beneath that large bonnet. So, let's have a quick look inside and see what this brochure has to offer. Okay, well, there's a gentleman speeding along with his young lady in the, uh, the Mark III. From here you can easily see the raised front bumper and the uh, rear corner bumpers were slightly modified as well for the Mark III. Uh, the Spitfire came out in 62 and in 1965 it was revised and became the Mark II and two years later we had the Mark III. And there's the, there's the engine itself, all 1296cc of it, the twin carburetors, unlike the Herald. Um, but obviously it was largely, the running gear was largely based on that of the four cylinder Triumph Herald. And then you had the GT6 which was based more on the Vitesse. So let's see what Triumph has to say. That famous streamlined shape remains the same. So does that tenacious rally proof road holding. But under the Spitfire's up and over bonnet there's a lot more engine. And just as remarkably accessible as before. Except that now it's 12% more powerful. With 1296ccs delivering a hefty 75 brake horsepower. The top speed of the Spitfire Mark III is 100 miles an hour. An acceleration through the gears from 0 to 60 competes with many of the world's most expensive 2 and 3 litre cars. Effortless power and a boost for better driving. As roads everywhere become more crowded, there are two factors in engine development which can make an important contribution to our safer, more enjoyable motoring. Smooth, fuss-free performance and the ability to accelerate rapidly, especially in the vital middle ranges between 40 and 70 miles per hour. So I was yeah, making a point of the performance angle of the little Spitfire, which was a rival of the MG Midget and the Austin Healey Sprite back in the day. But I always thought these cars and Spitfires were much nicer looking cars. The Spitfire Mark III inherits the same beautiful Michelotti coachwork as its predecessors, but subtle restyling has given the Spitfire a sleek new front. This facelift isn't just a styling gimmick. The new front bumper lo location gives even better protection. There we go. It's obviously raised a little, and it's got the rubber pieces on the overriders. Uh, also, uh, also new, a very handsome, very efficient fold-away hood, an integral side lights and front indicator flashes. Previously, these were two separate lights, I seem to recall. But yep, there's a Spitfire racing along. No rear wheel tuck under, so he was obviously taking it easy, because it was a, one of the Spitfire's uh, downfalls, or a negative points, was that independent suspension, which you could, uh, it would tuck up quite easily. If you backed off quickly in the middle of a corner, the back end would tuck up, the car would lift up at the back, and you would, if you weren't careful, you'd be soon facing the opposite direction, as I... Uh, found out on a number of occasions, not to worry. So let's have a quick look over here. And there is the chassis, which is largely based on that of the Triumph Herald. You can see the, the single transverse rear spring going on there. Those are the, the two drive shafts. The main difference between the Herald and the Spitfire was that the Spitfire had a central chassis and structural sills on the body here, whereas the Herald had outright, uh, outriggers and which came down here and back in here and they used to rot away quite merrily so the sills on the Spitfire down here are structural whereas on the Herald they're not and here we go again about all the handling where the roads are rough the revelation begins where lesser cars bounce and jolt you at every bump in the road each independently sprung wheel of the Spitfire smoothly absorbs all irregularities underfoot you corner with a remarkable deftness and precision the tightest bends, the craziest corners they're all in the day's work for the Spitfire. Yes, as long as you took it easy. Proved at Le Mans. In the 1965 Le Mans, a Spitfire covered 2,282 miles in 24 hours at an average speed of 95.07 miles per hour. Came first in its class. Another Spitfire came second. In the last few years, 
Spitfires have chalked up a whole string of race and rally successes, including class wins in the Tour de France, the Geneva Rally, and the gruelling Monte Carlo Rally. Magnificent. And there, of course, we've got a bit of promotion here for the uh, front disc brakes, because uh, many cars still relied on drums back in the day. And, of course, the uh, Spitfire's famous turning circle lifted once more from the, uh, the Triumph Herald saloon and convertible. And, uh, that, was a, that was a real feature of the car, actually. I remember that well. And, uh, it's a very, very simple structure. Obviously, you've got independent suspension at the front as well. And it all, it all seemed to work quite nicely, as long as you didn't push your luck. Uh, over the page, what have we got? We've got a, a gentleman again, impressing the young lady with a folding hood because on the on the Mark 1, the Mark 2, you had to assemble the hood frame from different sections and then drop the, the hood material over it, whereas on the Mark 3, it introduced a proper folding hood, which was a, a huge improvement compared to what came before. And then we've got the uh, the interior itself, which I always thought was a nice, comfortable place to be. And the, uh, the wood dashboard of the Mark 3 always looked a bit nicer than the painted black job in the, the cars that had come before. Yep, step into a tailored cockpit, and the Spitfire cockpit abounds in all kinds of thoughtful touches. The contoured buckets, bucket seats with locking device, adjustable steering column designed to telescope on serious impact, pile carpet, draft free hood, sporty little gear shift, all controls within easy reach. Wind up windows, anti burst door locks, passenger grab handle, and sports car instrumentation. Magnificent and plenty of soft padding in all the right places. A bit like myself. New Spitfire refinements to own a Spitfire Mark III is to drive a sports car with many built-in aids to better driving. A typical example, twin reversing lights. What other new luxury items have been provided for sophisticated Spitfire people? Oh, the wood-grained veneer instrument panel and a three-spoke 15-inch dish steering wheel with ribbed spokes in chrome. And there they are. Very nice indeed. And then we go to the back page where we've got the specification for the Mark III listed out. All the usual information here bodywork information, equipment levels, lights, instruments, controls, capacities, suspension details, and dimensions. And there is mention of the optional steel hardtop that you could buy for the Spitfire. I always thought the the spitty looked best of all with the hard top on, and so I'm surprised they didn't make a little bit more of it in the brochure, other than just mentioning it at the back here. But I guess, you know, if, if you wanted to drive open topped everywhere, the hard top wasn't much use. But in the winter, it was a, a real bonus to have the hard top on, and it did tighten up the handling quite a lot, I seem to recall. So, yes, that's just a quick look at this uh, Spitfire brochure from 1967 car that I'm particularly fond of and uh, this brochure was actually my uncle's he had a Mark II Spitfire back in the day until he crashed it and uh, this was one of his and he got it from Williams Motor Company sales of Deansgate in Manchester okay thank you for watching and uh, more brochures very soon <laughs>